This is Film Center. Your number one show for real entertainment industry news. No fluff, all facts. Now, here are your anchors, Derek Johnson II and Nicholas Killian. Hey everyone, the Film Center. My name's Derek Johnson II. I'm Nicholas Killian. And today we're joined by a comic book writer. We're joined by... Jamal Anansi. Jamal, how you doing? Oh man, I'm doing great, man. Fantastic. How about y'all? How y'all feeling? <laughs> feeling pretty, pretty good. good. Yeah, it's, it's Wednesday. It's a hump day. <laughs> hump day. <laughs> hump day. As you guys know, we do take the show on the road, and currently, where, 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 which part of Los Angeles is this? I don't even remember. We're in Santa Monica. We're in Santa Monica. We're in Santa Monica. So, want to tell us a little bit about? Uh, so, you're a comic book writer. Right. We'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a second. Mm-hmm. We want to know about Jamal. Were you we want to always... know how Jamal got to be Jamal. Oh. Give us the secret. Were you always like a, a writer? Was there, uh, there was some inspirations you had when you were young? Like you were always a writer? Yeah, man. My mother, she was a uh, special ed teacher. And the same techniques and tools she used to teach those kids, she used on me. And it worked so well to where I was reading and writing my name by the age of reading and writing, period. By the age of two, so I was, I was able to. Oh, yeah. so you're just a genius, actually. No, I was a genius. It was <laughs> genius. Just, 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 yeah, I was the just, A on you know, your head is A plus student. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it worked for. I was just above average, and I didn't really know about it at the time. It was, it was just like fifth grade. I was able to read at 11, 12th grade level. I was able to read and comprehend and write pretty good. And for example, when I would go to the elementary school library, all the books were elementary school books. They were thin and simple, and I didn't like those, so what I gravitated, to- gravitated towards was those thick books in the back, the largest who were... Were you more into best. fantasy, or what books back there would really got your interest? Man, what got me is, man, Greek and Roman mythology, Sinbad the Sailor, Ali Bob and the Forty Thieves, yeah. like those. And those were thick books. I pull them out and they were like, and I was reading comic books and watching TV and cartoons. When I would get a thick book like that and had to blow the dust off of it, it was like, oh man, I'm finna enter this world. I'm finna go on this great adventure. And that's exactly what happened, reading those stories. The Iliad and the Odyssey and things like that. I was reading that at very young ages, not really understanding or comprehending all that, but still engrossed in the stories. So I fell in love with not just stories, but epic. Epics, epic tales, epic quests, the hero's journey. And so that kind of triggered my imagination from a very early age. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of, we, we've had a lot of people on the show. A lot of people on the show. And there's always something that's quite interesting. People say what their profession is. And then that's also why we like to then instantly go into what they did when they were young. Because there's always those little breadcrumbs of who yeah, you are now yeah. in the history that they never thought they, who they would be. Did you ever read the Boxcar Children? The Boxcar Children? No, I did not. Okay. No, I was like, when I was a kid, it was, man, it was, like I said, comic books, and mostly it was cartoons, man, Power Rangers and X-Men and Spider-Man. Early 90s stuff. Yeah, when it was, that was a golden age of everything, man. You get cartoons every day, and on the weekend, it's Saturday and Sunday, man. That was good money right there. So you're from uh, Compton, right? Compton. My whole family's from Watts, Jordan Down Projects, but moved around a lot till we moved to Compton, and that's where I was uh, raised for the majority of the time, yeah. So there's a whole bunch of culture that comes out of Compton. And would you say that that environment really instilled a part of you to be expressive? Yeah, man, uh, for better or for worse, man, because not just to be expressive, but to find some type of way to find individuality. And in doing that, you, I lost my individualism and was immersed in the gang culture and the gang lifestyle. And I, was, I regret that, that whole choice to this day because I was living that life. I became, I'm an ex-gamer right now. I'm no longer a gamer, no, li- no longer lived that terrible life, but I became a gamer when I was 14 years old. And uh, Can you talk about what led you to um, the LA culture, LA gang culture, it's like it's, it's celebrated to a certain degree, especially back then. You see it in movies and TV shows and music. NWA was really big. Yeah, exactly. Not just MWA. You had Snoop Dogg and the East Siders, man. You had yeah. Dads and Corrupt. Biggie had, versus Tupac. Yeah, the whole West Coast thing. Like, gang life was like if you weren't a gang member or trying to be some type of thug or gangster in that way, then you were a square. And that was that was the worst thing you can be like a nobody. When I got immersed in that, especially a kid who moved around a lot, who wanted to fit in, do nothing more than to fit in. He was moving around a bunch, so you don't really, because when you are stationary, you have those people who are like, oh, man, I've known him since I was two, three, exactly. four, five, and now it's year 15. Exactly. So I've known someone for 10 years. You can be more connected to that person. Exactly. Right? When you move around a bunch, it's like, I've only known this person for a couple of years. I, had, only a couple I had no real identity. I had who I thought I was and who I knew I was, but me trying to fit in and just make friends, I moved around every year. Every year it was a new neighborhood, a new apartment, new house, new school, new neighborhood, new friends. Was that stressful? Hell yeah. I mean, what was the reason for moving around so much? When you poor in L.A., man, you got to make a way. And even though we're moving in progressively better situations, but still it was like I didn't see it like that. It was just 
me being a kid and just trying to figure out, okay, how I'm gonna make friends. And nothing worse, you know, for a kid than to have no friends. Yeah. So yeah, my yeah. whole goal was, how can I make friends quickly as possible? So whatever they're doing, that's what I wanted to do. And that's what eventually led me into the gang lifestyle. You know, when I moved to my last neighborhood, when I was in Compton, I was about 13, 14 years old. You know, just so happens, you know, the kids around the neighborhood, you know, and around the corner was gang members. So when they asked me, hey, you want to be from the hood? You want to be a gang? I was like, yeah, for sure. No problem. Trying to fit in. Exactly. Yeah. Not really knowing or comprehending what the true consequence of my choice would be. All I knew about being a gamer was what I saw on TV and what I saw in the movies and music videos. It looked glamorous. It looked great. The cars, the money, mm. the jewelry, the girls. Why not? Yeah. What kid would not want to be a gamer when it looked that good? When it looks good, like it, it looks it's, fun. it's just fantasized. Exactly. Right. Not knowing the true consequences, man. Like I said, like, there's nothing glorious about being a gamer. There's nothing magnificent or great about destroying my community, destroying the people that live there, whether it's through drugs or through violence mm. but not just doing that but terrorizing my community and then causing the police to come and terrorize my community as well because they're looking for people like me but right. they're picking on like everybody me. exactly the people who are innocent exactly. who have nothing to do exactly. with exactly so i'm perpetuating the thing we don't like the most that the, the profile yeah exactly the fear of the black man because i was every negative stereotype you could say about a black man in america mm. and i was did that by choice mm -hmm. and because i made that horrible choice i became a slave by choice by eventually going to prison. I got locked up for my for my behavior and for my crimes when I was 19 years old, man. Man, that, that's just so heavy. And, it, and it's, it's crazy because some people think, oh, they're just doing it just to do it. But a lot of times it's for that identity. They want some sort of social connection. And unfortunately, like I say, either two people are going to raise you. Either your, your parents or the streets. Yeah. And yeah. so then what happened when you fell in love with writing? You were like, I think I want to, I think I am going to take this path. I was in prison. I was doing my 11th year. When I first eventually got found guilty, I had life. So I was, but while living in prison and being a gang member, I had no satisfaction. I was miserable. Everybody's miserable. Prison is literally like being in hell and being a ghost at the same time. So your whole mm. life is on pause. You're invisible to the outside world, but yeah. the world is still moving forward. So I was a miserable person and I just got disillusioned with being a gang member and I was looking for some type of some way to do something different. Like an outlet. Exactly. And thankfully, the laws changed. SB 261 was basically was a law that, you know, stipulated that because all people, kids who committed a crime when they were 23 years of age, they were granted, we were granted a chance basically to go to parole board because they say, science says that our frontal lobe is not fully developed. That's our decision-making center. So they, so you're not <clears throat> fully in control of all your acts. In fact, exactly. there's a lot of and there's, there's a lot of people, when you talk to them, they have two points, points of consciousness. There's a whole bunch of jokes on the internet where you're like, oh, you're like five, you're like playing with your friends, and they say, oh, what, what, where am I? What's going on? It's like drops. And then there's a second drop that happens where if you're in your mid to late 20s, you think about yourself when you were young, you're like, I was thinking, but was I really thinking? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So how did comics and writing, how did that come to you? Was that a form of escapism? And then how did that come to you in prison? Because you yes, were already a fan of cartoons before you got there. Yeah, when you live a life, you forget all about that. And you just, you just get immersed in just trying to survive. But like I said, I, I was in there, I was being miserable. And one of my old cellies, he had comic books. And one of the comic books he had was Miles Morales, Spider-Man. And oh, man. yeah, and it was oh, you know yeah. written by Brian Michael Bendis, and I was just even though he teamed up with Sarah Pacelli at that time, I was it was Marquez. I forget his first name, but Marquez was the illustrator. So I'm saying, I'm like, man, this is dope. Was he black? Yeah, man, read it's it. It's a black Spider Man. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm like, let me check this out. And I hadn't read comics for about 10, 15 years at the time, or something like that. So I'm reading. Them, I'm like, man, these are dope. These are amazing. And I, I was just immersed. I'm like, okay, this is fun. But I was still living that life. And like I said, the law changed. And I went to the shoe, which is you get in trouble for doing stuff up in there. And I got out, man. I had a conversation with a friend of mine, man. His name is Monster Ken, man. He's from out of L.A. And he said, we was having a conversation because I was moving away from the life, man, just trying to get my mind right, trying to do something positive for us. And he was like, we're talking about what we're going to do when we potentially get out. And I was like, man, I said, I don't know. I want to go to trade school, something like that. He said, okay, think about it like this. What's the one talent you have? The one thing that you're naturally gifted at that you wouldn't mind doing for free. That's what you should make your job. That's what you should make your career. That's what you should yeah, get paid for. Definitely. And the idea popped in my mind, but I was too afraid to say it because it sounded strange. But the idea that popped in my mind is I want to write comic books. So the second time we had the conversation, I was afraid to say it. The second time Especially we had the conversation. when you're a weekend American male, yeah. it's not really something that like nah. that's propagated for you to do. Nah. As a black writer myself, it's crazy. I learned how to actually read the comic books. Yeah. I actually was didn't I actually had trouble reading when I was young. Didn't really like it. You know what I'm saying? My pops is in the military. 
and uh, my mom when she was off she was uh, uh, teaching and stuff like that so getting those comic books actually how oh, I learned how to read that way because they are engaging yeah it's comics are amazing because for one it's like you can have a short attention span and still enjoy a comic how many right. times have you read a book and been like man I wish I can see what's going on that's what a comic is what's the easiest way to grab a child's attention pictures to, exactly pictures with colors pictures that show people in action and fighting and it would be that much better if I can write those comics and actually teach because when you write a story that's a holy endeavor man because you're not just writing a story for entertainment you can potentially put thoughts and ideas in a person's brain potentially when your audience is a, your audience is a child so I thought later on through my thinking but as I started to continue to write comics I'm like man I have to write responsibly teach about honor self-respect what it means to have courage integrity and instill these things with the experiences that I came from but put them in stories that kids can relate to and a lot of times when people think of oh, a black writer from the hood he's going to write something like an urban nah I don't write urban novels or urban comic books not that that's bad or anything right, but that's there's not nothing like wrong thing. with that you exactly. don't like pigeonhole yourself exactly like why man I, I like I said I was a child of cartoons like I love watching game of reading Lord of Lord watching of Aaron reading Lord of Rings yeah, yeah. and the Game of Thrones and Walking Dead and all these things like this big, huge world, especially when I was in the shoe reading the Game of Thrones, and I was like, had that Just, big... just for clarification yeah. for our audience, when you say in the shoe, what do you mean? Oh, segregated housing unit. That's where you go. It's like, <laughs> in prison, we call that when you're in... And prison is like, when you're in prison for so long, we like being on the main line, which is basically where everybody is at. It's basically, okay, that's essentially like freedom. But when you go to the shoe, that's like being in jail, inside a jail. And in the shoe, is basically, you can probably Google it, but it's probably like a 10 by 12 cell. Some of them are that big, some of them are smaller, where you're segregated, yeah, for a, you're, in, you're inside there for 23 hours a day. Maybe you get a TV, maybe not. Maybe you get pillows in a cover, maybe not, depending on the officers in there and how they feel in that particular time. It's real slavery, man. It's, it's, and it's a jacked up experience. But in there, you, you're lucky enough. I was lucky enough to be have be able to get books in there. You sign a little slip, you have requests for books you want, they give you books. And I got into Game of Thrones like so that. So when did you know, so you're in this situation, right? And you're like, okay, I think I'm going to be a writer. I think that's what I want to do. So then how did you, you know, go from oh i'm in this situation until i'm literally gonna write myself out of it because just like it's i tell a lot of people this writing is like almost magic when you truly study it yeah because it's okay if i can make if i understand how to make my characters better maybe i can reflect that myself yeah how did you say okay you know what when once you made that decision okay i'm going to be a writer this is what i want to do how did you start to practice or develop that skill? Man, it was God that had a lot to do with it, man. And also a brother named uh, Hashima. Hashima and Abdul. Now, Hashima, Jinsai, man, he's a brother, man. He'd been in prison for about 30 years now. And his Aseli, his brother, brother Abdul, has been in prison for about 40 years, 40 years and some change or something like that. And they, Hashima, he was in the shoe for about 20 years and got out, and Abdul, he was in the shoe for about 32 years, and he got out through a whole program that they had to go on hunger strikes and everything because they was in the shoe, man. That's cruel and unusual punishment. Remember how I described you like that 23-hour lockdowns in that yeah. box? Literal, no human contact. You can't talk to your folks, nothing like that. All you have is your mind. Your mind has to be exceptionally strong to deal with that for 32 years, for 20 years, for any amount of time. I, I don't know there. if I could do it for a couple of weeks. I That's know, wild. and these brothers were in there for, they, they real political prisoners, by the way. They was they was out really fighting a good fight for us. What brothers Fred Hampton were doing, they was just they were on TV, but these brothers were really down in the trenches, man, doing the good work for us, for the people, not just for black folk, but for everybody who needed that For help. equality. Exactly, for equality, period. And they, when I made the decision to write, I didn't really know how to go about it. Like the brother I told you about, when you had the conversation, he was like, man, just try to figure out what you got to do in order to pursue that. So I got transferred from that prison to another one probably five or six months later and I had I was collecting comic books at the time I had a whole bunch of comic books on my shelf what's your, what's your favorite which one of your favorite uh, just some of your favorite comic books to read just in general oh man well it's authors really Jason Aaron man when I read that Thor man that God Butcher man oh, it was amazing yeah. homie and I, I feel bad for him what they did to that movie man because it's like why they do that but uh, Brown Michael Bennis of course he the one that got me inspired Jeff Johns if you can make freaking Aquaman look amazing yeah, you, you can pretty, do like, special. Yeah, Jeff Johns and Blackest Night, and then I read that Watchmen, the Doomsday Clock. Come on, homie, that was a masterpiece. Reading like that and studying Mark Wade, sitting there and studying the whole, Grant Morrison. The whole, like, Infinity Crisis, X-Men on, versus Hickman. Avengers. Come on, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, oh, my gosh, the first time I read The Sandman, yeah, I was like, yeah, whoa. Yeah. Like, damn, these stories be deep, exactly, man. Exactly, because it is. That, and that's how, when I read The Suiciders, man, by Lieber Mayho and Brian Azarello, freak, Azarello, forget his name, but that's when I 
I saw what comics can really do. That's when I saw you don't have to just write superhero stories. You can really write real right. human dramas that's action, that's visceral, that's gritty, that, that's shocking. That means Not just something. shocking just for shock value, but shocking is, wow, this is possible. This is, that's when you can elevate it to not just entertainment, but art form. That's, and that's, that's one of the things, okay, when I met, let me rewind, because I'm going a little ahead of myself, but when I met Brother Shima and all like that, he really encouraged me, man. He saw them books on my shelf. He's like, man, you like comics? I'm like, yeah, man, I'm a writer. I ain't wrote nothing. But that's what I wanted to do. I had that aspiration. I had that goal. He's like, speaking though sometimes. Exactly. I speak into existence all the time, man. And so he's like, that's dope, man. Write me something. So, okay, cool. Now at that time I was reading Drizzle series by Ari Salvatore and all like that, and about the dark elves and all like that. I'm like, okay, why the dark elves? People with black skin and white hair, why are they evil? Why is it nature of society? Why is that evil? Why is that looked down upon? Okay, cool. I can flip this on my head because I always had my imagination going, so I wrote something up for him and gave him what was essentially the first four issues of my, my comic book series, The Godless. I gave him that and I wrote that. Com- What's the name of your comic book series again? The Godless. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I gave it to him. He was like, man, this is, wow, I wasn't expecting this. This this is really good. This is really amazing. Write some more. And that's what got me going, man. And through his persistent encouragement, that's what's amazing, man. When you have a brother, man, that has any type of potential, and then you have somebody else to come and pat you on the back and say, man, good, good job, man. Keep going, man. You're doing good work. Mm-hmm. Especially when it's something positive and it wasn't something negative like I was doing before, like when I was a gang member and I was doing God knows what. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Destroying yeah. my community. I have people to pat me on the back for that. Yeah. Because that's what it a, was. It's a great positive influence in yeah, our exactly. way. Exactly. So yeah. then when you when you got out of that situation, when you got out of prison, and you still had this real big passion for writing, you know what I'm saying? Right now you have a comic book, a comic book series. I'm working on it right now. Right. Yeah. I'm working on it. Yeah. Was this what you had designed back then? Or you're like, oh, okay, this is something new, fresh as soon as you get out? No, nah, this is, man, I was writing. This happened, me and this conversation with him and all like that happened about in 2015, six, no, 2017 about. I started writing, started working on my craft. That was just initial. When I read that early stuff, it was like painful, but I see the potential story, the, the, story, the potential of the story I was writing. And so I would... It also shows growth. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You look at your previous stuff, you're like, oh, this isn't as good as I thought exactly. it was. It's because you've that, grown. Exactly. I made that progress, man. And not just that, because I had to study. I only had so many comics I can get because I only had what people were, had to sit to me or what other people in prison had themselves as far as comics. So I would sit over and I would read comics, the same probably like 30 comics I had over and over again from the authors I mentioned before Bendis, Grant Morrison, Mark Wade, Jason Aaron when I would study their techniques and I would really try to hone my craft and get an inspiration from them and not only from them but also I would watch real dramas like I said on Masterpiece Theater they had episodes like uh, shows like Downton Abbey and Poe Dark and all type of that that helped show me how it was possible to develop an interesting drama to where how is this to show this engaging and this interesting and this good but there's no action there's no nobody fighting and something like that. How can it just? How it's can not it, blood being drawn? No, right. well, Poe Dark a little bit, but it's well, mostly about thriller. that. Exactly, right. but it's that's technique, and I have to really sit down and study those techniques and develop my craft and, and go from there. Even reading Tom King and appreciating his work and how it's pacing, the pacing of to get what you wanted out of your characters, what you want out of the story. So when the action actually does happen, then the reader can appreciate it. See, this is something I have to learn over time and learn what the patience and the ultimate gratitude and appreciation I have from the people who were patient enough to read my, my, read my work. And these are not scholars. These are prisoners who have a whole bunch of other stuff better to do. But at the same time, nothing better to do at all. They just wanted something. And they were they were homies of mine, friends of mine, that they seen I was doing something positive, seen I was doing something different because... I was living a horrible life being up in there and doing what it, you watch the movies and all like that. Traditional game member, I was doing all that. But they saw me who's as respected, I guess you can quote unquote say, how I was, but they, I was doing something different. So they're like, why are you changing your mind? What are you doing? What was the catalyst? Exactly. What are you doing? Let me ask you this. Since, so now you're, you're a professional is writing. What do you think about, there's a, a big movement right now about people who are moving away from television well, sorry, from films in general into more television because of the quality of writing. And now people believe the quality of writing is also going down. So I'm moving back to, to, to films. And there's just been like, there I say this, even before the AI takeover <laughs> a few yeah, years ago, yeah, yeah. there's been this flood of, and I can tell you someone who works in a, a business, and I'm sure it's a flood of bad scripts, bad writing. It's like people don't care anymore. Why do you think that is? Money. Because they're trying to push out, especially when they see how much money was initially made from the Marvel movies. And the Marvel movies were early on, they were made with tact, with a plan, with real, they were not funny. 
You understand know what I'm saying? They were had funny moments, but they weren't made specifically with the. It wasn't a comedy. Yeah, right. it wasn't. Ca- what made them change was Guardians of the Galaxy. When they said, "Oh, it's funny," and it's made a whole bunch of money. Guardians of the Galaxy made a whole bunch of money because of the movies that came before, and this one just happened to be funny. But don't change your whole mold. And but regardless of all, that's a whole different conversation. But I'm saying all to say this: when you're trying to expedite mm-hmm. movies for the sake of money instead of actually taking your time and crafting great art, that's why I took all. One of the reasons I took my time because I was in prison. You can't just say, oh, okay, I'm finna, I'm finna create a movie, but you ain't wrote, you, you just started writing a year ago. No, sit down and work on your craft. Think get critiques. It's like going to school. You wouldn't be, go to the NBA straight out of high school unless you was that dude. Right. And nine times out of ten, out of all the people that go into college, and all like even that, some to play basketball. Are that dude don't even do it. Michael Jordan exactly. didn't go to the NBA nah, straight he, out of he, high nah, school. No, he did what, four years? Three right. Years? Exactly. He worked that. And he he's considered to be, the, he's to, the, to be the best. Exactly. And look, and that's what I did, man. I didn't just work on my craft as far as just me sitting down and studying all these books and these TV shows, but I actually went to actual school in prison. I went to Bakersfield College and got my associate's degree. But I paid special attention to my English class and my writing class. I paid special attention to they were talking about tropes and archetypes and literary tools that I can use. So it's like different things that I. That, so different what strategies your, I can use in order to write better stories. So what was your studying process? I, I usually don't talk a whole bunch about... We have a lot of people come in here to talk about their process when they're writing, but we right. actually don't talk a lot about studying process. I mean, personally, when I study writing, I actually do... I actually bust out an Excel sheet. Yeah. And I literally will write down the scenes, who's in the scene, what their motivation in each scene, stuff to like how many pages and how many words this person has, Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, how many times you you see the person, what their fears are, what they're trying to get from somebody else who's connected, like, and one scene, I can have, well, I'm not just saying scene is in scripts, but like scene is in books and and whatever, you can just be like a a big Excel sheet, that's what I do to study, but what what, what would you do to study? What I do, depending on what I read, after I read it, I want the feeling, what feeling did I get? Do I like it? Do I not like Such it? Such your emotions. Yeah, exactly, because that's what you're really going for. I want You want to write a story that after the reader or the watcher is done, you want them that you want that story to hold with them after they leave, days, months after. You want to stick with them. And so the stories I read that had that effect on me, I studied them as far as what were the story arcs? How did they get to that point? As far as, let me give you an example, I can do Miles Morales Spider-Man. To get from a kid who was scared, I don't want the powers, to, okay, I'm dope, these powers are amazing, I'm really doing good, to, oh, this is heavy, man, I didn't got too much responsibility, man, this is, things is happening to my, oh, my mom dies, what the heck, I'm cool on this, what's the whole arc, and this, that made me, and not just, and it wasn't no, and this is a white dude that wrote it. Mind you, Brian Michael Bendis. Yeah, it's funny, because he actually, he wrote it in, inspired by, I almost said Childish Gambino, but... Well, oh, uh, Donald Glover. Donald Glover. Donald yeah, Glover. Yeah. So it was. He was inspired by Donald Glover on Community when he said Spider Man should be black. And it's just. And it takes that, but it's, it's more than because that's the initial idea. That's a spark. The initial spark. You know, but it right. still takes real skill to develop a character and write him like that to make him as likable as he is. Especially in a time period when people talking about washing, race washing. Exactly. And it's not even about that. It's past that because when you write in its purest form, it's not about race washing or whatever. That's a it's new just term. a character. Exactly. It's just a character. It's like a joke. If, it, if you think it's a joke is offensive, it's only offensive if it's not funny. But the joke is funny. funny. And that's exactly. So if the story is good, period. It doesn't that's matter. That's what matters. You're not going to even care about the race. Who gives a crap? It's a good story. I was in it. I love that character. And that's what it's about. That's the effect I wanted to have. And that's what I studied. Not just studying that as far as character arts and story development, things that happen between the action. Because it's a comic book. What are we here for? We're here to see the action. The boom, right. pam, pow. You right. know what I'm saying? I'm saying, but... Beyond that, what else I studied was the page count, the panel counts. When there were action happening in the, in the um, comic, how many panels did they typically use? Two, three, four. Why? How were splash pages used? And this, all these strategies I had to, all these things I had to learn by just counting the pages. Looking at know. the masses. Yeah, exactly. And not even just that, but my brother, Shima, my idol, my mentor, he gave me a book, Words for Pictures, by Brian Michael Bendis, which was like serendipitous, man, a coincidence guy working. Because that was the actual author who wrote say, the comic. Do you want, do you want to say the, uh, the name again? For Words us? for Pictures by Words Brian Michael Michael Bennett. It's about the art. It's about the, the art of writing and how to get in the industry, basically. Yeah, and that he gave me that book. After I wrote that initial story and gave it to Ashima to write, and he said it was amazing, he came back with that exact book. And it was crazy how God works, man, because that book by Brian Michael Bennett is what got me in the comics when I read Spider-Man and that my home, uh, old homie sale. And the Red Spider-Man, Miles Morales. So I'm like, man, this is crazy. This is what I, I think this is what I'm supposed to do. That's when I had the first initial idea. I think this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to write comics. And also, with your experience, you actually also put yourself on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You And I mean that in a way in which is like you 
didn't wait for someone to give you some sort of handout. You were like, oh, I'm going to start writing comics. I'm going to do it. Yeah, I mean, I had, for, look, man, I just, you know, prison is a miserable, miserable existence, man. Everything is gray. The clothes are gray. The walls are gray. The police are uh, buttholes. And it is life or death in there because you got to, you know, you got to survive. And so I was looking for an outlet. And all the, the pain and turmoil and the trauma I was going through, I needed some type of positive outlet for it. Because right. the outlet I had for that was violence and getting into trouble and hurting people. I didn't want to do that anymore because that got, they didn't really just hurt them. I hurt me as well. I got tired of hurting people. I wanted to better myself. And so having that outlet of sitting down and writing those stories, I was able to put all my thoughts and my emotions. I was able to make that my therapy. And all a lot of majority of my life experience I had, I put them in my books and I put them in my stories. How did you, what do you think about the, the modern stigma of basically, because I'm, I'm a, I do write fantasy and sci-fi myself, and as an African-American writer, especially working in entertainment, you get all this, oh, we want you to write about this hood story. We want, they only like hood and slave stories, it seems, right? Mm. So when Black Panther won, won a, a Best Picture, I was like, this is a really yeah. mean something to me. What do you think about that current stigma that they really push, they really only green light, oh, Slaves movies, oh, gangster movies, and stuff like that. By man, you gotta be the change you, away from. Man, that? you gotta be the change you want to see. Forget what they doing. What you want to do, and then make it good. You know what I'm saying? Like forget. Make it undeniable. Exactly. Make the make. It's talent. It's talent, homie. A good story is a good story, regardless of who it's made by or what it's about. It. If you're making a good hood movie, then make it good, but make it different. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying, regardless of what you don't let nobody put you in a hole, put you in a corner, tell you what you can do. If you want to create who knows what sci-fi fantasy, then do it, but make it a good story. Because if it's a good story, they sit down and look and they're like, wow, that was amazing. That's how you change the game. That's how Jordan, was it, Ken Peele? Yeah, yeah, Jordan, Jordan Peele. Peel, he yeah. changed the game. Oh, black. Well, get out. And mind you, it was a good, great black horror movie called Candyman way back in the day yeah. that was revolutionary. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? But it was a one-off. they like, okay, that was I'm in a rough. That was a one in a million. They can't do that again. Now you got this artist who create masterpieces. And now you got a whole slew of people coming after that trying to recreate that magic. You know what I'm saying? Forget what anybody say. Like how they say, oh, the comic book industry is down, it's not selling anymore. So what? So what? What they got to do with me? Love, what they got to do, do with it. you? Right. Exactly. I'm not doing it for the money. I do it because I have to. I got. I do. I write comics. I write stories because I have a need to. I want to teach these kids how how to lead better lives. I want to teach these kids the only way to make it out the hood is not through selling dope, through a game banging, through a sports, or through rapping. They can make it through creating art. You don't have to rap. Be a poet. You yeah, want to be an artist? Then draw. You don't have to tag on walls. Create a comic book. They get right. paid millions for that, man. I, I often hear the real difference between an artist and a, 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 a criminal is when they do their outlet and if they can sell it. Yeah. Because let's, let's, keep, let's keep it up. If someone tags the side of a wall and they don't have permission to do it, then it's illegal. But if the same beautiful, if it's the same picture and they tag it with someone's permission, then it's worth money. Yeah, but thing, I, yes, in a way. But see, that's that's a niche thing because it's sometimes it's the, it's that's art too. As far as when you do it, when you're not supposed to do it, yeah. Because it's the act. It's the, it's the it's the revolutionary act of doing something not supposed to do. But yet, what I created is beautiful. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like this is that's how artists. That's why art is so dynamic and so wonderful to so many people. Because anything, literally, literally anything can be art. But when you create art and it means something to so many people, including yourself, and people can appreciate it, regardless if it was done illegally or not, that's what's beautiful. That's what's amazing. And you did it for free, mind you. You tagged on that wall, not getting paid. You just wanted to make a statement about yourself and what you was going through. And you decided, right. I, I, I need. To, it's better than going out and robbing somebody. It's right. going better out than shooting somebody. Right. I decided to put my emotions and my thoughts and my trauma and my frustrations on a wall. How cool? And then how do how do people start that's to get beautiful? How come people who are younger? So most people who listen to the show, they're people in the industry, right? But there's uh-huh. all those people who want to break into the industry, break into comics, break into a whole bunch of different types of art. How can someone get started to possibly do what you do or maybe have, do you have some advice for someone who wants to do what you do? Start. <laughs> yeah. Start. Put one foot in front of the other. And with me, what I did, I just, I had somebody to challenge me. Okay, like my brother Ashima. He came to my cell. Oh, you like comics? Yeah, I'm a writer. I hadn't wrote nothing yet. I wrote things before, like little Spoken personal into things. existence. Exactly. But I said, I'm, he said, okay, well, write something. I said, oh, crap, I better write something now because I'm a man of my word. I got integrity. Unfortunately, I grew up in prison. And growing up in prison, it teaches you certain values. Bad values, too, but also good values. One of them, the main one, is being a man of your word. You say you're going to do something, then do it. And he challenged me to write, and I said, okay, I'm going to write something. And I created the catalyst for what changed the rest of my life. And not only that, not just my advice would be not just to start, 
but also find things to encourage your your passion. I've found not just people, but books as well. Words for pictures, writers on writing comics, everything that can fortify your own understanding. And then study your craft. If you're passionate, find time to do a little bit every day. You ain't got to write a whole novel in a day, but just do a little bit. Find some type of way to contribute to your passion. It's been really great having you on the show. Is there anything that you could tell us about that you're working on right now? Oh, right now I'm working on uh, it's a story called The God Blade. It's basically like a spinoff of my main story, The Godless and the Dark Ones. Now, The God Blade is about a princess named Princess Kali, and basically she's it's essentially Game of Thrones but in Africa. Oh. You know, she she's a princess. She's the youngest out of her whole family, and being a princess, her whole life is basically dictated to her what she's gonna do, who she's gonna marry, things like that. And her grandmother, who's the queen, the midnight queen, she basically says she asked her grandmother, "Why is my life like this? Why I can't decide anything for myself?" Her grandmother told her that the only way you can decide things for yourself is if you were queen. And she took that to heart. She heard that message. So now she, now she's on the road to become exactly. The queen. Yeah. Not just on the road to become a queen, but she has the blood of an elder guy running through her veins. So she took not she not only has that blood, but she took a mythical sword who was made by the god of death. And she's taking that sword and a couple of her friends. And she's decided basically, I'm going to take this sword. Now, what better way to make myself a queen than on the bones of this goblin king who's been terrorizing our land? So where can everyone follow you? Follow me on Instagram at Jamal underscore Anansi. J-A-M-A-L underscore A-N-S-I. Jamal Anansi. And also on TikTok, too. All right. Don't. It's been great having you on the show. Thank you. Thank you. And if you guys are listening, it, it can really come from anywhere, as long as you have the will and the determination. Man. And, yo, it's been great having you on. My Thank name's you. Derek Johnson II. I'm Nicholas Killing. And I'm Jamal Anansi. And we'll see you next time. See you. This has been Film Center on Comic-Con Radio. Check out our previous episodes at ComicConRadio.com. You can follow the show at Film Center News on all major social media platforms. Tune in next Wednesday for a fresh update. Until next time, this has been Film Center. Hey, do you like anime and manga? Nick and I are big fans of the genre. Yeah, we recently discovered a manga named Tamashi. It's written and created by Ryan McCarthy, and it recently just came out with its 10th volume. Now, Tamashi is an isekai about a girl who gets transported to another world called the Ancient Lands. She gains mysterious powers and must fight demons and monsters to find her way home. Check it out on Amazon, Blurp, and get a physical copy at RyanMcCarthyProductions.com.